That's Dr. Bob Hanner. So Bob is a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Guelph, uh, but also in the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario, which you may know is, is sort of a hotbed of uh, molecular biodiversity studies and, and DNA barcoding and things like that. He did his undergraduate at Eastern Michigan University and a PhD at the University of Oregon. He was, uh, and I'm going to flub this one, so please correct me, Carl Fleisch, postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and he was also a curatorial assistant of the Ambrose Monell Cryo Collection, so a cryo collection of tissues uh, for a variety of different species. And I think you really helped to shape that, didn't you? When you yeah. Um, and he was scientific director at the Coriel Institute of Medical Research, which I believe is in Newark, New Jersey. Camden. Camden, New Jersey. I got New Jersey. Yep. <laughs> um, he's also served as president of the International Society for Biological and Environmental Repositories, which actually is a, a very important initiative and a very important consideration in the kind of work that we do and that Bob does. Um, he has been at the University of Guelph, my alma mater. My father was a professor there, so we got cheap tuition. So that's very much <laughs> uh, And he's been there since 2005. Uh, and he's developed a really stunning uh, research program that really spans lots of different things, molecular biological diversity. Um, I think food quality assessment is, is another thing that his lab is renowned for. So testing using molecular techniques, whether something is what they say it is. DNA based biosurveillance of agricultural pests, plant viruses and vectors of disease. Um, but he also, and one of the reasons I was so excited to to have Bob come up here, is working in environmental DNA, and this is focused on on things like conservation of aquatic species of risk. So, of course, directly pertinent to the, the core topic of the course uh, of the workshop. And the one final thing I will say is I, I first met Bob in Argentina, so not in Guelph, <laughs> and it was at a, a DNA barcoding workshop at the uh, Museo uh, Museo de Ciencias Naturales Bernardino Rivadavia, if you want to Google that. Uh, a very well known uh, museum in, in South America. And I can't remember when that was, but I think it was in the late 2000s or. Yeah, maybe 2007 or 8. Yeah. And we had many excellent vino tintos. <laughs> some really nice pitos. So, uh, <laughs> so we chatted there, and, and that's where I first came to know Bob. So. Um, and Bob kindly agreed to come up and, and talk a little bit about some of the eDNA metabarcoding work or uh, eDNA, uh, eDNA aquatic biomonitoring work, not just metabarcoding, but some other techniques of ones. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very excited about uh, the program you've put together for uh, training folks in eDNA. As I hope you'll come away with after this talk, there are a lot of applications for these new tools. Um, we're kind of gone from the canary in a coal mine as an indicator of uh, environmental quality to now being able to survey uh, nearly whole communities nearly in real time with some of these methods. Uh, and it's not a moment too soon. Um, as we enter into the Anthropocene, it's a different key. Okay. What button do you normally push to advance the slides? Okay, so if I just click on the arrows, that'll move it. All right, thank you. So the International Convention on Biological Diversity has a very jargony definition of biodiversity, as you might expect. Um, it's a bit of a fuzzy concept. It spans biomolecules through species, uh, all the way up to whole ecosystems and biomes. Um, as Steve mentioned, my research is focused broadly around molecular biodiversity. So it's a pretty exciting time because now we can start to look at genes and gene sequences in the environment to identify species and even the communities uh, of organisms that inhabit some of our aquatic ecosystems. Now, last night, Beth Clare spoke about vacuuming the air and looking at environmental DNA from the air, which is really cutting edge work. 
and I won't pretend to be able to keep up with her as a storyteller. What I'm going to do is expose you to some stuff we do in my lab. Uh, I hope that you will come away with uh, a deeper appreciation for some of the applications, but also the challenges in using eDNA. Uh, just as a quick outline, we'll talk a bit about DNA-based identification. Then we'll talk a bit about some targeted approaches to identify a particular species uh, or more passive detection where we can use high throughput sequencing to look at uh, community composition. And then we'll wrap up with some of my musings of where we are in the field. Okay. There we go. So um, we've known really since the late 1990s that there's enough variation in short gene sequences that we can use these standardized sequences to tell species apart. Uh, this really started with a pair of Canadian scientists. Uh, I believe it was uh, Bartlett and Davidson published a paper in Biotechniques in 1997 called FINS, or Forensically Important Nucleotide Sequencing. So they started out with suggesting that if we sequenced a bit of the mitochondrial cytochrome B gene from known species, that we could use that as a lookup table to identify unknowns, fragments, processed remains, eggs and larvae. Um, and so this FINS project started to pick up some momentum with the fish community, but it was really my colleague Paul A. Bear at the University of Guelph who coined the DNA barcoding metaphor that launched this into an international campaign. So the idea is that DNA is made up of an alphabet of four letters, essentially, if you think about the four bases of which it's composed. So if you sequence this standardized bit of, in Paul's case, he promoted the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1 gene as a barcode, you can see here is a bit of a, a visual representation of a barcode, about 650 bases. And here you can see these black dots represent nucleotide differences between two species. And it's these combinatorial differences of nucleotide substitution that allow us to use that sequence like a barcode to identify unknowns. So this is predicated on working with taxonomists who can provide expert identified reference material. We sequence that barcode marker. And so now this couplet of species name and sequence essentially becomes our lookup table where we can sequence an egg or a larvae or a fish fillet. And if it matches to something in the database, we can infer a species level ID. So that's really what launched this whole Barcode of Life initiative. It's been going on for well over a decade as we've been building barcode libraries for fishes and birds and insects and uh, essentially eukaryotic life on the planet around us. And that's been a really exciting endeavor to be a part of. Now, one of the challenges with DNA barcoding is assessing the presence of a barcode gap. So in other words, for DNA barcoding to work, there has to be less variation within a species than between. If there is this barcode gap, we can use it to confidently differentiate and identify species. This is where the barcode metaphor breaks down a little bit. So in a barcode that we would put on a product in a grocery store shelf, it doesn't vary, right? It's Kleenex. But in nature, we will have a little bit of variation in, within populations of a species. So there's some of this within species variation, but as long as it's less than the amount of genetic distance to the nearest neighbor species, we can cleanly tell species apart with barcodes. But sometimes this genetic distance overlaps. So we've been pretty excited about barcoding as a tool to ID unknowns, but we've been building our barcode library and kind of undersampling intraspecific variation. So our initial focus was, let's get sequences of all the different species we can. But Jarrett Phillips is a former PhD student and now postdoc in the lab, who's really been pointing out that we haven't paid enough attention to intraspecific diversity, and that we, we may be overestimating how much confidence we can have in using barcodes to identify species. So we've been kind of pushing on a campaign to get more population level sampling of these species. 
Um, and this will have some implications, as we'll see later when we try to do IDs with DNA. Sometimes we don't always get resolution to species. That's kind of the take home point of this slide. Generally, barcoding works good to tell species apart. Sometimes closely related congeneric species can share barcodes or have very similar barcodes. So there, it may not be perfect resolution like a barcode on a box of Kleenex, but still it works pretty good. So one of the other things that's important to realize is that we've been, you know, since the time of Linnaeus describing species, um, scientists have described about 2 million species of plants and animals over the last couple of hundred years, but we don't really even know to an order of magnitude how many species we share our planet with. Some people have estimated maybe eight to 10 million. I have friends who study protists and say there are probably 50 million species of protists alone. So this is kind of a, a wicked problem. So one of the things that I think is important for people to realize, particularly when we delve into the small things that aren't well studied, pretty much everything but the charismatic vertebrate megafauna, um, that we don't really know species boundaries. So in this case, if we're looking at things like fishes or birds that have been really well studied and we know the species boundaries, then we're really talking about using DNA barcodes for DNA identification. We can use it in a forensic context. That's how we've identified seafood fraud. We've got a good barcode library for fishes. We know what the species of fishes in North America are. But for a lot of other things, we're out in the realm of DNA taxonomy, where the species boundaries aren't that well known. So in that case, taxonomists are now actually using barcode sequence similarity as a tool to give them an idea of preliminary, what are these barcode clusters telling us? And now we can go in and look at identifying species, not only with conventional morphological taxonomy, but also with DNA data. And that's given rise to what we call turbo taxonomy. It's pretty neat. We've seen people releasing papers with the description of a hundred beetles that include their barcodes and morphology. But for a lot of the things where we don't actually have taxonomists to put names on them, we can give an alphanumeric identifier to each of these barcode clusters. We call that a barcode index number or bin. So we're actually kind of using that as a proxy for species. And that won't feature a lot in today's talk, but it's important to know that this is kind of an on-ramp to getting these things named scientifically. So in my lab, as I started working at the University of Guelph with Paul Bear and colleagues around the world on barcoding fishes, one of the first things we set out to do was build a reference sequence library for fishes of Canada and then North America. And this immediately proved useful because folks at NOAA said, we'd love to know what species are using some of these new marine protected areas. And you've got fish larvae kind of drifting pelagically before they get big enough to settle down on a particular reef. So it wasn't clear to them whether or not these marine protected areas were actually serving as habitat for the species they were looking to collect. So they could scoop up all of this ichthyoplankton, send it to us, and we could generate a DNA barcode, match it to the library, and tell them what was there without them having to wait years for these fish to grow up and be morphologically identifiable. And we did some other interesting stuff. A uh, former PhD student in the lab, Tim Bartley, uh, was a food web ecologist. And he said, you know, we've got some of our boreal shield lakes with and without introduced species like smallmouth bass. And Tim was really curious, do these introduced species, the aliens like smallmouth bass, compete with top predators like lake trout? And so he set about collecting a bunch of fish and squeezing them until they barfed and bringing back um, stomach contents and looking at them under a microscope. And you could see little chitinous bits of exoskeleton or other globs of goo or some sort of parasitic worm. And so some of this stuff visually, you know, next to impossible to identify, or maybe you could get it to family, uh, but we could barcode it and get species level resolution, even of, of the tapeworm in its stomach. So that was kind of cool. And what it did, was it started to turn some conventional paradigms on, on its head. So namely, in this case, people thought open water species like brook trout, or I mean lake trout, stayed out in the deep water. The smallmouth bass feeding in the shallows, there's no habitat coupling, very little competition between them, 
And that was conventional wisdom based on diver observation and, and some preliminary stomach content analysis. But as we started to sequence the gut contents, we saw all sorts of evidence of competition. The Lakers are coming into the shallows from time to time to feed. The smallmouth bass are going out into deeper water. So these habitats were much more coupled from a food web perspective than people realized. So these are some of the kind of cool things we could do with DNA barcoding and our reference sequence library. And one of the things that we ran into with IDing uh, seafood fraud and testing fillets, U.S. Food and Drug Administration said, that's cool, you found that this, you know, fillet that was sold for top dollar is, you know, sockeye salmon is actually farmed Atlantic. What we'd like to know is what's in this tin of salmon. Is it really sockeye or is it adulterated with some pink and chum salmon? Well, it turns out that canning process with high temperature and high pressure really breaks down the DNA. So we couldn't amplify a full length barcode to sequence and figure out what the species was. But what we could do is exploit the patterns of variation in the barcodes to make species specific primers and probes for very small fragments of degraded DNA like you would find in tinned salmon. So there we can't tell you what of all species it is, but we can say, is there sockeye? Or another assay to say, is there pink? Or is there chum in this mixture? And we were developing some of these qPCR-based assays to differentiate some other quarantine pests that are visually very difficult to identify. So we'd been using this technology to deal with degraded DNA, and that kind of set us up for thinking about environmental DNA. So environmental DNA gets shed into the environment, and it's highly degraded. So we can't amplify in sequence full barcodes from environmental DNA, but we can get these short fragments. So for those of you who haven't been taking the workshop, what is environmental DNA? It's viewed as the genetic material that's shed by an organism into its environment. So this happens through a number of ways. We're shedding epithelial cells in our metabolic waste. The mucus layer on fish has uh, DNA in it. Uh, if an animal dies, it's decomposing and it's releasing DNA into the environment. Um, gametes when they're spawning. So there's all sorts of sources of eDNA. We're all leaving traces of DNA in our environment because there's DNA in every cell of our bodies. So it wasn't long before people realized that these molecular methods that we use are so powerful that we don't even need a piece of tissue to sequence an ID. We can actually start to filter water and extract the DNA from that filter and sequence it and then see what's in the water, a very, uh, a very powerful tool. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail around the eDNA other than to say that the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission uh, commissioned this research brief on uses and limitations of environmental DNA. It's a publicly available resource. There's a slide deck with it. If you're trying to communicate to students or managers or the lay public, there's some nice information there to help communicate what eDNA is. I'll just pick a few of the slides here. Basically, why would we use it? Because not all species are easy to catch using traditional methods like hook and line or nets or electrofishing. Um, and even when they can be caught, if they're rare, we might miss them. Um, and also in really large bodies of water like the Great Lakes, you know, you can't say net the entire lake. So, you know, in this case, eDNA can be applied to difficult to capture species at low abundance in places where our traditional methods just don't work very well. So how does it work? We take a water sample, we filter that water, run it through a, a paper filter, extract the DNA from that filter, and then uh, we screen it for the presence of the organism we're looking for. And there are two ways we can do this. The first way is taking this sort of what they call active surveillance. In other words, using that qPCR method, making a species specific primer and probe to detect, say, smallmouth bass or red side dace. This PCR method is nice because we can deploy it pretty cheaply at large scale. And I'll talk about some examples of that. The other approach is what we would call passive surveillance, where we're using high throughput sequencing. So instead of just using a molecular probe to say, is smallmouth bass here, 
we're sequencing short fragments, mini barcodes, if you will, from the environment and getting a sense of what are the different fish in the community, in the system. So it's a very powerful tool. And I just want to talk briefly about some of the applications. Well, it won't be so brief. Academics like to pontificate mercilessly, so brace yourselves. Um, I work a lot with primary industry, regulators, so the regulated communities that have to comply with environmental regulations. And we started thinking about this environmental DNA going, geez, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for kind of next generation compliance here and thinking about how we, you know, implement our regulations, the kind of permit designs, some more advanced monitoring. Because this data is inherently digital, we can get into electronic reporting, make it more transparent uh, to the community. So we wrote a little commentary talking about the role of eDNA in this kind of applied biomonitoring. Uh, and one of the things that we realized is that policymakers weren't talking to uh, regulated communities who weren't talking to environmental consultants who weren't necessarily talking to scientists. So we put together this conference called Pisces, or Pathway to Increase Standards and Competency in eDNA Surveys. And we brought all of these folks into the room. And it was great. We had about 120 people across Canada representing all of these user groups, environmental consultants, academics, regulators. Um, and from that meeting, spun out a working group of Canadian Standards Association. And we've developed the first guidance document or standard around eDNA data reporting. And we've harmonized that with the DFO's guidance document on the kind of data that they would want to see from someone who was generating eDNA data, what kind of metadata that would need to accompany it so that they would consider it actionable information. So we're now kind of moving the bar. We're getting closer to taking this into the realm of applied ecology and outside of just research labs. But there are a lot of things that we still need to understand in terms of properties of eDNA to really know the boundary conditions around how we can use and interpret this data. So I'm going to just introduce you to some of my students and the projects we've been doing in the lab. This is Danielle Bork, a former master's student. At the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario, we have what they call the Limnitron. It's a series of these uh, six 30,000 liter tanks that our experimental ecologists love to do studies in. So they'll put in algae and daphnia, and they'll look at these sort of boom and bust cycles as the algae grows, and then the daphnia uh, grow up in response and graze it down. And then they like to see what happens if we change the temperature, we add nutrients to cause the algae to, to go up and down. And so we thought, well, this is a pretty neat system where we can get in here and sample eDNA from the daphnia. So Danielle made one of these species-specific primer and probe sets to do qPCR on daphnia. And one of the nice things about quantitative PCR is it'll not only tell us that there's daphnia in the tank, but it'll give us a relative signal strength of how much of that daphnia eDNA is there. So we're thinking this is a closed environmental sort of mesocosm. The daphnia could be going through these boom and bust cycles, but maybe the eDNA just accumulates and they're dying and laying at the bottom of the tank and decomposing. Or maybe the eDNA kind of tracks the daphnia boom and bust cycles if it's degrading fairly quickly. We don't know. So in that case, we sat uh, about looking at um, two different vats where they were held at 25C and 15C. And what we saw is that in warm conditions, the copy numbers of eDNA actually tracked the abundance of daphnia quite nicely. Because here the ecologists were actually sampling the vats and counting daphnia. So they had a good idea of how many were there. And the eDNA signal was tracking it pretty well. At cooler temperatures, there was a lot more of a lag. So the eDNA wasn't breaking down as much. And that's not a hugely different temperature when you think about it. So this is one of the questions people have. Great, you can detect species, but can you tell me something about relative abundance? Decidedly, maybe, right? There are a lot of things that, that factor into this. So 
we thought, well, that was kind of cool, right? We showed in a mesocosm that it, it could track abundance. So in this case, we were working with APRI, the Electrical Power Research Institute, and a lot of our power facilities in, in train eggs and larvae of fishes as part of their cooling water intakes. And so they're required to monitor the larval fish species in abundance that are going through these cooling water intakes and that are being cooked. Um, and typically they would do that by netting uh, things out of the forebay, trying to microscopically identify fish larvae. And in this case, they wanted to test a couple of new methods. Uh, they had a pump system where instead of netting, they were kind of pumping water up continuously to count eggs and, or larval fishes. And then we thought it'd be a great opportunity to tie in eDNA. And we did this kind of targeted base detection for three species, gizzard shad, yellow perch, and alewife. No one had seen an alewife in, in this part uh, of the Great Lakes in many years, but it was an open question. So we compared multiple times a day, netting, pumping, and environmental DNA. And we saw an interesting correlation where eDNA concentration correlated with this kind of pump capture of larval gizzard shad. And both the pump and net and eDNA data were all correlated for yellow perch, which was the most abundant species in the system. And what was pretty interesting is that in this case, the eDNA data within spans of hours was tracking the density of fishes that they were netting out of the forebay. So in the evening, the small fish would come into the forebays, they'd catch more through netting, and we would get more eDNA. Then by morning, they would start to head out, the abundance in the nets would decline and the eDNA signal dropped too. So that was pretty interesting. We're like, well, that was a pretty, pretty good correlation the span of hours, not days, but it was late summer. The water temperature was really warm up around that 22 to 24 degrees C. So in warm water, the eDNA breaks down pretty quickly and it gives us a signal that's more near contemporaneous with the occurrence of the organism but in cold water, maybe not so much. So this is Sharon Wang, a PhD student in the lab, and she's really interested in, well, what are the processes driving this difference in kind of shedding rates and eDNA production in the environment? So she's a theoretical ecologist. She said, you know, we have a metabolic theory in ecology that explains, uh, you know, this relationship between body mass and temperature but there's also an energetic hypothesis that says, yeah, uh, this kind of could be driven by body mass or temperature and also food availability. But then there may also be issues around life history. Um, you know, does a small fish, you know, does one one gram, let me rephrase that, do a hundred one gram trout shed the same amount of eDNA as one 100 gram trout? We don't know. So people are kind of trying to answer some of these questions. And that's what Sharon said about to, to look at, again, using this experimental mesocosm, using that Daphnia assay that Danielle had developed, but this time putting individual Daphnia in a tube, a little test tube with a set amount of algae, and then monitoring eDNA every couple of days for 10 weeks. So this was a nested experimental design. We had two temperatures, high and low, and then we had high and low food, and then she was just looking at counting, did they molt? Are they pregnant? So Daphne are kind of cool. Um, they're what we call cyclical parthenogens. So at certain parts of their life history, they essentially clone themselves. So the little ephippia or babies in their backs are clones of the parent. And all of the individuals that we put into the tubes were clones of each other. So we're trying to kind of control for this sort of genetic variation by using these clones, subjecting them to this experimental design. And then every couple of days, she would pour off the algae, look at the Daphnia, see if it had grown, whether there, it had molted, if there was an exoskeleton there, filter that bit of water uh, and uh, precipitate out the DNA, add in fresh algae. She did this for weeks. This is what we do to torture people to get a PhD. Um, it was a lot of work and she used droplet digital PCR to try and give us as precise of an estimate of eDNA copy number as possible. Uh, and again, we're trying to look at this framework of what's really driving this. Is it just metabolism or is it food availability or is it life history processes? And 
we used uh, a linear mixed model to analyze the data, and we found that there were a number of things that had strong effects. Body mass, uh, this food and temperature, reproductive status, and of course, a dead Daphnia in the tube was shedding a lot of eDNA as well. So sort of the take home message here is that the eDNA shedding rates depend on a lot of simultaneous processes. And so body mass was the strongest predictor. The bigger you are, the more DNA you shed. That kind of makes sense. Um, what we didn't expect is that it wasn't so much a molting event, because I might have thought, well, these things have exoskeletons. They're not like us sloughing off as much epithelial cells. So maybe when they molt, they exude more eDNA. And that didn't seem to be the case. But what did seem to be the case is when they were pregnant. Now, all of a sudden, there's a lot more eDNA being shed as a result of that pregnancy. So life history can be important. Recently deceased animals were pumping a lot of eDNA into their tube as they die and they rupture, a lot of eDNA comes out. So this is a complicated issue of what's driving shedding rates. There's a lot going on here. It can be your environment, can be your metabolism, food availability, um, you know, your reproductive status or life history. So like, okay, shedding is complicated. So we're going to shift gears here and talk a little bit about um, how can we use these targeted approaches for looking at something like a species at risk, like Blanding's turtle. So we thought, okay, fish, we know we can get eDNA from pretty well. They've got this nice slime layer. They're moving around a lot in their environment. So they're a pretty easy target, it turns out, to pick up with eDNA. Something you know, like a semi-aquatic reptile that's brumating down in the muck over winter they have to essentially expel all of the waste in their guts so that it doesn't rot while they're brumating. So they're not very metabolically active. They're not moving around a lot. They're not slimy like a fish. So we're thinking this could be a pretty tough test for eDNA. Can we actually bore holes in the ice and suck up water and look to see if we can detect Blanding's turtle? And in this case, we had some uh, radio tagged animals. So there were some control sites where we knew that we should find them. So they're shedding less eDNA because they're not that metabolically active, but the water is really cold. So that should preserve the eDNA signal for longer. So again, we're using this species specific assay that uh, Tzatziki Luisa Quintana, a postdoc in my lab had developed. And they went out and did a lot of sampling and what they found was that in many of the expected sites, they found them. Um, and then some of the sites where they thought they would find them, we didn't pick them up. But in one of the sites where they hadn't been seen before, we did pick up eDNA there. So we recorded a new habitat occupancy, likely or suspected detection. So yeah, this turned out to be pretty, too, pretty powerful. And this is cool because the conventional survey method, if you're tasked by the ministry to monitor for Blanding's turtle as part of your license to operate your mine or what have you, the current protocol is you go out and you stand on the edge of the wetland with your binoculars, you glass for two hours. You repeat that six times. If after 12 hours of visual observation, you don't see a Blanding's turtle, for the purposes of your compliance, you can check the box and say there are not Blanding's turtles here. I think that likely has a pretty high false negative rate associated with detection, frankly. So I think this could be a better tool. And more importantly, in some of these convoluted wetlands, now we can get out and sample in the winter where we could actually kind of grid the wetland off and sample out through the ice. I think this is going to give us a better probability of detection. So that's kind of cool. For those of you who pay attention to species at risk, we have a lot of unionid mussels that are uh, imperiled here in, in Ontario. Uh, they're very sensitive to pollution. So in this case, we were working with Environment Canada. This is a former master's student, Louis Gasparini. He developed one of these species-specific assays for wavy rayed lamp muscle. And working with Environment Canada and Ryan Prosser at the University of Guelph, he had permits to have some of these animals in a tank in his lab. So we could do validation of the assay Lewis developed in a mesocosm where we knew we had wavy rayed lamp muscle and yes, it signal works. But then our question was, well, if we took one muscle and put it in a cage out in the Speed River near Guelph where these muscles haven't lived in decades, so there would be no background signal, could we detect it? And if we were sampling near that single muscle, 
we could pick up that eDNA signal reliably. The farther we moved downstream though, it became more hit or miss. And when we upped the amount of muscles to 10 in a cage, we could detect that little plume of eDNA a bit farther downstream. But typically these muscles would occur in fairly large beds. So in other words, what do we get out of this? Well, the assay works, it's sensitive, but we also encountered some cases of PCR inhibition. So we've heard a lot about that. For those of you in the workshop today from BioRad and others, there can be compounds in the water that will inhibit our ability to use PCR to effectively detect things. So what Lewis came up with, we were looking at the literature and said, well, what if we put in an internal positive control and multiplexed it with our assay? So in qPCR, when this curve starts to go exponential, when your eDNA target really starts to amplify, we can use that to infer how much DNA is in the reaction. So the further to the left this curve is, the sooner it goes you know, exponential, the more DNA you have in that sample. So if we put a bit of synthetic DNA with a primer and probe set in multiplexed with our target, and we know we put it in at this concentration, so at cycle number 18, it should start to go exponential. That was our pos internal positive control. And if for some reason that curve of our IPC was shifted to the right, we would know something's inhibiting that test. So if we don't detect the wavy rayed lamp muscle, we can't say it's not there. We might say, well, the test isn't as sensitive as it should be because our IPC is showing very reduced sensitivity as well. So all of the assays we've been developing in my lab, we multiplex with an internal positive control to help us measure for this phenomenon of PCR inhibition. And what we found that was a bit surprising in this case is that after some rain events, we were repeating these studies and we were getting more inhibition. Same river, same spot, different time. So the inhibition, the PCR inhibitors in that system were kind of fluctuating. So I think it's really important if we're gonna use these tools that we use them with proper controls so that we can ferret some of this stuff out. So back to Tzatziki, uh, the postdoc in my lab who was working on Blanding's turtle. We got a call from folks uh, in Parks Canada at Kajimkujik National Park. They have Blanding's turtles there. They also have a problem with some invasive alien species, namely chain pickerel and smallmouth bass moving into the park. And when the Blanding's turtles are little and their shells are soft, things like pike will gobble them right up. And so they really wanted to know how far into the park these invaders had moved because they wanted to put in a weir to block their movement. Uh, to keep them out and protect the Blanding's turtles. But this site in Kaji, there's a lot of humic acids and tannins in the water. The pH is very low. These are things that can chew up eDNA, can inhibit its detection with PCR. We're thinking, huh, this is a tricky one. So in this case, we took five biological samples at 10 different sites, filtered a liter each, extracted the DNA, and then we did some six reps for each of those samples without any kind of a cleanup and six qPCR tests after using a commercial Zymo spin column on the DNA extract. The Zymo kits are meant to remove inhibitors. So we said, well, here's a tough situation. Let's see what happens with and without a Zymo kit. And it was pretty interesting because in some cases, we didn't get a detection pre-cleanup, but after we cleaned it up, we did. So cool, There's and we saw with our IPC, the internal positive control, that there was some inhibition. So we're testing and Zymo picks it up. But in other cases, we got a weak detection, pre-cleanup, and then after we cleaned it up, we didn't get a detection. So what we learned from this is that Zymo kits can remove some of the inhibitors, but they're also not 100% efficient in the recovery of your DNA that's in there. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. They can help, but it's not a silver bullet. Um, now, more to the point for Parks Canada, um, we were able to detect Blanding's turtle in some of these sites where they suspected them to be. Um, we did see PCR inhibition because of the water chemistry there. Uh, we found that the Zymo cleanups could help a bit, but more importantly for management, 
the invaders had already moved well above where they were planning to put in the weir. It was too late. There's no reason to try and put a fish passage barrier in. So sadly, the invaders were already well on their way into the park. This is Cam Brown. He's a master's student in the lab working with Margaret Docker and I. Margaret's a sea lamprey biologist at the University of Manitoba. And we got funding from the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission to develop methods for monitoring invasive sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. Now, they've been there for 100 years or more, but they cause a lot of problems with the recreational fisheries. They see lampreys as an invasive alien species um, are not really what you want in the system. That's fascinating. On my master slide, there is a picture of a sea lamprey, but on what you see here, that big white spot should be a picture of a sea lamprey. I've never seen that happen before, um, but at any rate, so we set about to try and optimize and validate a monitoring protocol for the larval sea lamprey and compare electrofishing, which is the conventional method, across a large spatial temporal scale uh, with eDNA. Um, because really for, for the, the Fisheries Commission, they want to go out and figure out where what little creeks and tributaries on the Great Lakes are spawning habitat for the sea lamprey. And then if they go in and hit them with lampricide, is it effective? Did it work? This absolutely doesn't scale with electrofishing. DFO and U.S. Fish and Wildlife each have a couple of crews they send out to do surveys. They do this double pass electrofishing, looking for larval lamprey. Um, it's very labor intensive. So, oh, there's the picture. So we set about to first test a couple of kits. Uh, we've been using a thing called the Osmos, uh, which is built by Haltech in Guelph. It's essentially a battery operated pump in a backpack. So we can just suck water through a filter at the flick of a switch, record the volume, and it grabs temperature and some other snazzy uh, bits of metadata that we would like. But for more of a citizen science or low cost approach, you can essentially use a cordless drill and a peristaltic pump to suck water through a filter out of a bottle. So $10,000 instrument, $250 worth of parts, a uh, big difference there. Um, so we looked at, collected 230 samples across 29 stations in the summer and fall last year, compared these two in, in several different categories. Um, so we made a decision on the filter apparatus. The Osmos outperformed uh, the, the DIY kit uh, in the amount of eDNA that it recovered. The sampling crews much prefer to use it. Sitting there holding a cordless drill on a peristaltic pump uh, sometimes can take 20 minutes or more to filter a single sample if there's a lot of sediment in it. It's pretty tedious, but it works. So we decided to use the Osmos, but keep the, the little uh, DIY kit as a backup. We also were trying to figure out what kind of filters should we use? There are nitrocellulose, there are glass fiber filters that one could use, there are different pore sizes. So we started to do some head-to-head -head comparisons on different filters and pore sizes. And what we found we got the best yield with was a five micron nitrocellulose filter. And the nice thing about that bigger pore size is that it allows us to filter water without clogging quite so quickly. So that's what we've been running with uh, on the sea lamprey project. So just to give you a quick overview of some of our findings, we get really good detections here in some of the Southern Ontario sites that CAM has been sampling. All of the purple dots are where the larval assessment crews found sea lamprey and we found sea lamprey eDNA. And then the green spots are sites where we didn't. So in other words, both methods gave really good congruence um, and you know we could start to map out where these damn things are going. We also built in a lot of negative controls to start to estimate contamination rates and other things. So we did a few hundred uh, controls and we found about 3% contamination. So not terrible. And when you're taking a bucket of DI water to each site and sitting there, opening it up to the environment and pulling a liter of water out of that bucket as your kind of field negative control, it takes a lot of time and energy and, and money to analyze these things. And essentially what you're looking for is, do I have field contamination in my equipment or did my decon procedures work? So we've decided to reduce the number of these negatives to one in the morning and one at night. Basically, is our instrument contaminated rather than doing multiple negatives at every single site? So we, it just didn't seem um, appropriate from the data we have. 
So let's get to the punchline. What did we see? From the samples that we took in the summer, 85% gave a match. eDNA and electrofishing detected sea lamprey at that site. In 9% of the samples, though, there was PCR inhibition. So this was causing problems for the eDNA test. In other words, we might not get a detection, but it wasn't necessarily because the sea lamprey weren't there. It was because there were PCR inhibitors in the system. In 4% of cases, the crews found them from electrofishing and we didn't get eDNA. And in 2% of cases, we got eDNA, but they didn't find a, a lamprey uh, using their electrofishing. Now, this interesting changes a bit in the fall. So here we're only getting 70% congruence between the methods where we get electrofishing and eDNA saying there's sea lamprey at this site. Similar rate as before, about 7% of the samples had evidence of PCR inhibition. There was only one site that they got electrofishing and we didn't get eDNA. But interestingly, 20% of the sites we got eDNA, but the crews didn't see sea lamprey. And when you talk to the crews, they hate electrofishing in the fall. There's a lot of leaves in the water. The colder water caused the lamprey to have a different behavior. They say this electrofishing doesn't, they're telling me we don't think it works as good. And this data is telling me eDNA works better, particularly in, in those systems when you know getting out and doing uh, electrofishing may not be all that convenient. So here's some evidence that maybe in the fall your eDNA is more sensitive. And it's certainly a lot faster to pull a couple of water samples than to do double pass electrofishing. So we talked a bit about targeted detection with a qPCR assay that will look for a species like Blanding's turtle or sea lamprey. Now we want to shift gears to this passive method where we're using um, this eDNA metabarcoding. We're using universal primers to amplify a short bit of DNA, sequence it, compare it to a database. In this massively parallelized high throughput sequencing platform, we can get millions of reads from a single sample, and then we start to do a bit of bioinformatics ma uh, magic to see what we've got. And I am running woefully behind. So I will just say this is Kaylee Head. She's a new master's student who's looking at invasive round goby and at-risk Topeka shiner, where we're going to compare a targeted assay with this eDNA metabarcoding approach, um, just to see how these two stack up. So this is sort of a segue into the metabarcoding and some of the methods that we use, as I mentioned, qPCR versus aluminum iSeq. So some of the other projects that we've been working on, again, with Parks Canada, uh, this was out in the Peace Athabasca Delta, working with the um, Athabasca Chippewayan First Nations and their community-based monitoring program. They've seen a lot of impacts to the pad, which is the largest freshwater delta in the world and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. They're not seeing the returns of whitefish that they once saw. They're interested in knowing how eDNA might work. So we went out with them last fall, sampled a number of sites uh, where the Peace River is in, um, emptying into the Athabasca Delta. They also clipped stomachs out of fish camp and they said, we'd like you to metabarcode what's in their stomachs. We wanna know what the fish are eating because the, the white fish we do catch are coming back smaller than they normally should. So we did this work um, with the eDNA metabarcoding. We found a whole bunch of fishes that you would expect to be in the pad. And then we found Gobio gobio, this is a European fish, not known to be in North America, but US Fish and Wildlife put out a bulletin about a decade ago, putting it on their watch list, saying this would have the potential to be a nasty invader. We combed the literature, we couldn't find any evidence of any physically caught gobio in, in the system, but we found that sequence in multiple samples. Now they're saying that eh, it's not there, we would have seen it. We've detected it. I don't want to put everybody on high alert yet. Uh, we're still validating some of these methods, but that's a bit of a head scratcher why we're seeing this. And it, you know, it could be an aquarium release. Hopefully it's just some sort of a methodological fluke, but we've never worked with Gobio in my lab. So it doesn't seem like it would be contamination. Uh, nothing showed up in any of our negatives. So I'm a little worried about that one. We may have picked up an invasive alien species in the pad. Um, and so we were getting lists of the species that we were finding at each site. Um, 
It was interesting. Some of the managers there said, well, we don't think this works because you didn't get lake trout. So, well, yes, there are lake trout in the pad, but there probably weren't any lake trout near where we were sampling. It doesn't mean eDNA doesn't work um, necessarily, but uh, at any rate, communicating this invisible man phenomenon of eDNA to uh, managers isn't always easy. We also found in the stomachs um, a lot of things uh, that we would that we've known uh, the whitefish to eat, but more troublingly, most of the stomachs were completely empty. But we did get out a number of caddis flies and amphipods and um, other eggs and larvae of other fishes. So it was pretty cool. We could get some information on on what the whitefish were eating. This is a project we're doing with the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. So they've been tasked with developing a deep geologic repository to put all of our high-level radioactive waste from our nuclear plants. Uh, they're a non-governmental organization that's at arm's reach from the nuclear industry. Uh, they need to do baseline biomonitoring at the site where they're proposing for this deep geologic repository. This is a monitoring program that will have to go on for hundreds of years. And so they're saying, well, we're going to do all of our conventional electrofishing and stuff, but we want to build eDNA into this because we think that's probably the way forward if you're having to do this recurrent monitoring. So this site outside of Ignace up uh, in northern Ontario is now the most densely eDNA metabarcoded site on the planet. Um, they've collected hundreds of samples uh, last summer and again last fall taking three replicates at each site, um, or station as the DFO would call it, a negative control. Uh, we've built in a number of, of lab controls into the analysis. Um, Wabagoon First Nation is a partner there. Now we're working with the nuclear industry. This is a highly regulated industry, so we didn't do the sequencing in my lab. We have at the University of Guelph, the Agriculture and Food Lab, which is an ISO 17025 accredited lab to do this kind of molecular work uh, with sterile facilities. So all of the sequencing was done there, but the results were sent to us to interpret and report. And so Wabagoon First Nations uh, interested in a number of culturally significant species, and we were finding them, not only fishes, but things like snowshoe hare, gray wolf, beaver, muskrat. So we're getting things, um, you know, I don't see too many rabbits swimming. Maybe they come to the water to drink and some of the saliva is getting in the water. Uh, you know, maybe it's aerosolized feces that's kind of washing into the water bodies when it rains. Um, then we're getting things like Canada goose that you would expect. So this was kind of cool. We're getting detections, but with different markers. And we're seizing, seeing some seasonality to it, um, getting definitely more reeds from the wolves in the fall. It's still not a lot. Um, we were um, getting a bit better detection using CO1 than 12S, getting a bit more reeds, but CO1 wasn't always getting the same species. So there were some taxonomic blind spots. In this case, we made mock communities as experimental controls. So we took some samples of you know, bison and cow and dog and elk and horse and, and threw in to test, are these primers getting them? And the 12S primers and the CO1 primers didn't get all of the species. So we're calling these taxonomic blind spots. In theory, we would like to think our markers would pick up everything, but we now know that they don't. And so this kind of speaks to, if you really want to use this as a tool for monitoring, you probably need to be doing some pilot tests and make some mock communities for the things you really want to monitor to make sure that your markers will pick them up. So the takeaway message here is there is no magic marker. You probably need to use a few markers if you want to get really broad taxonomic coverage. Everybody wants to know about abundance. There are a whole bunch of reasons why I don't think eDNA tells us much about necessarily about biomass or individual animals, but we can start to look at landscape abundance. So here you can see the northern pike was at almost all of the sites we tested, uh, but white sucker only showed up a few times. So yes, the molecular methods will pick it up, but they are far, far less prevalent in that region than say the pike. Um, we are getting some of the birds. This was kind of interesting. We got the rough grouse in some sites. We got Canada goose. We weren't really even looking for birds per se. Our primary objective was to get at fish. 
but we were getting um, a lot of these things. And again, you can kind of see the different performance. So with the muskrat, both 12S and CO1 will detect it. With the snowshoe hare, it was only picked up by the CO1 marker. Um, again, red squirrel only picked up by the CO1 marker. So you have to think about your marker choice and, and what you're actually looking for. So this is a project we did up at the Detour Mine, now owned by Agnico Eagle. That's almost up to Moosonee and James Bay. Um, they have to do monitoring of fish communities around the mine site as part of their uh, license to operate. So they've asked us to come in and do electro when they do electrofishing to sample eDNA and see if our eDNA results are similar to what the electrofishing crews are doing. And we thought, yeah, we know this works pretty well. We've done this kind of thing before. But what would be cool is if we sampled eDNA, then the electrofishing crew got in the water and started to muck up everything. What would happen if we sampled again after that? So now we're getting highly turbid water. So we collected these paired samples pre and post the electrofishing crews jumping in the water. And lo and behold, we picked up some species that were pre-disturbance and others post-disturbance, and then a lot of them popped up in both. But so this kind of raises the question, all right, what's happening? Is eDNA surviving longer in the sediment? Um, maybe. There's some suspicion that the anoxic environment of sediments might preserve an eDNA signal longer. So maybe that's giving you a deeper look back in time of what was there rather than what's there right now in your pre-disturbance. So that kind of got us interested. We're thinking, geez, this is, you know, there's so much we need to, to study here. And we wrote a paper just kind of working with some uh, biochemists where we're now starting to question, well, do we even know what state eDNA is in? Is it cellular debris? Is it just naked DNA dissolved in water? Is it bound up to clay or silica particles? there's probably a good chance that the latter is happening according to some of our the biochemists that we worked with, um, uh, Mishi Sander on this paper. And so now we're beginning to wonder, well, are our methods really optimized for releasing eDNA if it's sediment bound when we think we're just pulling eDNA out of water? So this is what Erica Myler has been working on, another student in the lab who's we're working with Environment Canada to try and address this issue of what happens if we set sediment traps out to capture suspended solids? So her project is pulling aquatic eDNA from the surface. We also have these sediment traps out where we collect this kind of flocculent detritus. And then we're also taking actual benthic sediment and looking at what are we getting using different methods with this approach. Um, this is uh, just some of the reaches where they're they're working through uh, and ground truthing this. So they've done a lot of electro fishing there. This is pretty cool. Uh, it's the little creek running outside of Guelph, and we've picked up like 25 species with electro fishing. So we know what to expect with our eDNA studies. And then we started looking at electro fishing, the 12S primers, the vert primers, and again, lo and behold, there's one species that neither of the molecular markers got. So another taxonomic blind spot. Now we know, okay, these primers aren't gonna pick up uh, Cotus cognatus. Some of the things got picked up by both markers and electrofishing. Uh, and then there were other things that were popping up uh, using this 12S MyFish pipeline that likely aren't there. So this is a case where we have limited taxonomic resolution and this MyFish pipeline is kind of spitting out some wonky results. You know, where this, we talked about that barcode gap and in some cases there isn't much of a barcode gap here. So that MyFish pipeline seems to just kind of willy nilly spit out different fish species uh, when it should just say, mm, genus can't really get you to species. So we're trying to calibrate you know, which markers we can use to effectively ID what taxa and to what taxonomic level. And this slide is a bit complicated. It's just going through where now we're saying, all right, we've seen like Cotus not coming up, even though it was electrofished, neither marker is getting it. Is that a pattern we see at Detour and at NWMO and out in the Peace Athabasca Delta? If we're seeing these things repeatedly not being detected in different systems, we can start to infer, yeah, uh, you know, we have some taxonomic blind spots we have to deal with. We have some taxonomic resolution issues. 
This is Jenny Gleason. She's a PhD student, uh, former PhD student, just graduated this spring. She's really into macrobenthic inverts. They're indicators of watershed quality. So your caddis flies, may flies, stone flies, not very uh, tolerant of pollution. Uh, very good morphological taxonomist and stream ecologist. She got interested in, well, geez, the current methods for surveying these macrobenthic inverts are really labor intensive. You gotta go scoop up everything in a one meter quadrat, take it back to the lab, look under a microscope, sort out to species, enumerate how many individuals of each species. Takes a long time. And this is a common task that you're required to do for a lot of biomonitoring. So she said, let's take an eDNA sample right above where I sample my macrobenthic inverts. So she took them back to the lab and identified them. She ground them all up and just metabarcoded this slurry of organisms that she had ground up in a blender and did metabarcoding on that. And then she did eDNA metabarcoding on the water sample above where these were collected. And we were not prepared for these results. So the morphology and the tissue-based metabarcoding were very congruent. You ground up all the bugs and did metabarcoding, you got better taxonomic resolution than you could get microscopically, which makes sense. A lot of these larval EPTs, you can only ID to family. The metabarcoding would take them to species. But the eDNA metabarcoding was getting completely different things at that site. So the, not, the overlap between morphology and metabarcoding of ground bugs versus the eDNA was uh, very little to nothing in some samples. And we know the primers work because they generated all of these things in the bug shake. So it's not a problem with the primers per se, but now we're left kind of thinking, what's going on here? Well, we did a deep dive into our sequence data and the vast majority of the sequence reads were nonspecific amplification algae, bacteria, fungi. So even though these primers were designed for invertebrates, in this matrix of a lot of bacteria and algae, because we're talking about agricultural streams, a lot of runoff in Southern Ontario, the signal of these macrobenthics is getting swamped and only a few things probably coming from more upstream are coming through. So eDNA metabarcoding doesn't work very well for macrobenthic inverts, unfortunately. Um, this is Kat Nolan, a new PhD student in the lab. She's looking at trying to use eDNA now to look at community dynamics around harmful algal blooms, kind of following on what Jenny did. And the problem is we don't have great reference sequence libraries for all of these algal blooms. So she's taking water samples, going through these ultra dilutions to get down to a single cell in a well and try to culture them up and then take pictures of them with microscopy and build her own reference sequence library for these things while simultaneously doing eDNA metabarcoding to try and get a sense of, all right, what are all of these molecular operational taxonomic units or bins, as we talked about before, we may not have a species name, but we can put a, a unique identifier on one of these sequence clusters. So she's building a reference library, looking at microbial communities uh, and, and algae uh, diatoms and things, because there's now, the conventional wisdom was that algal blooms happen because of nutrient runoff. And I'm sure that that nutrient enrichment has a role to play, but there's new evidence suggesting that it's more than that. It's also what other members in the community are present that may cause microcystis to start producing its toxins. So we wanna know not just is microcystis there, because often it is, but they're not producing a toxin, but in response to other members of the community, they may. So we're digging deeper into some of these issues around the harmful algal blooms by trying to build reference libraries and do metabarcoding. Uh, I'm gonna, I promise, I will really try to wrap this up quickly. Um, one of the challenges when we're doing eDNA metabarcoding is just there are a whole lot of different bioinformatic pipelines people have developed. You take all of these millions of sequence reads and you've got to filter out chimeras and trim primers and denoise and deduplicate the sequences and then match them to reference databases. And it's kind of bewildering because there are a bunch of these different pipelines that people have used in the literature and students in my lab were kind of starting to use them willy-nilly. So we'd have one guy doing one fish project with one pipeline and another guy using another one. I'm like, why are we doing this? Nobody could really justify why they were using one pipeline over another. Typically, well, this is the one I know how to use that I could make work. 
So um, I brought in Kassan, who is a bioinformatics graduate, uh, to help us try and pull all of these different tools out of the literature, see if she could compile them, help our students run them, and come up with something that was a bit more well-reasoned. Um, some of these things are black boxy. Other things like Anna Kappa, the paper sounded great, but you try and download it from GitHub and it won't compile and install. You write it to the authors. They're like, yeah, no, we wrote that paper five years ago. We don't use that. Nobody's paying attention to it. Um, so it's essentially an orphan software tool that the paper sounded great, but you can't put it into practice. Um, some of these other things don't scale very well, uh, but we found that some of them actually were pretty agnostic to a marker. So some things like MyFish were pipelines built only for 12S data, and they have their own reference library that's heavily biased to Southeast Asian fishes. So that's why when we've tried to run 12S data from freshwater fishes of Canada through this MyFish pipeline, there aren't 12S reference sequences for a lot of our fishes. So it's spitting out some of these wonky results that don't really make sense. MetaWorks is an interesting new pipeline that's come out uh, by Terry uh, Porter at Environment Canada, where you can use your own custom reference library and it'll even give you a bit of a confidence in your match. Because that's one of the things like, okay, I get this list of species, but how confident am I that the match is good? So we've kind of narrowed down the milieu of pipelines to a few that we like and that you can plug in different reference libraries, depending on if you want to look at fungi or bacteria and trying to standardize on them and, and help our team kind of find our way through the woods. And there are different strengths and weaknesses of some of these things, and some of them share uh, different bits of code, and I'm not going to go into all of that, but I feel like we're finally starting to have a clearer picture of how to bioinformatically analyze this data in a way that's scalable to these big projects, like with the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. So that brings me to kind of my end musings here. I sort of look at what I call the unholy trinity of eDNA. So we've got unanswered questions around the ecology of DNA, eDNA. In other words, its origin. Do all species shed at the same rates or all individuals? What factors modulate shedding in the production of eDNA? What state is it in? Is it naked DNA? Is it cellular debris? Is it bound to particles? Um, how far does it transport in the environment? Uh, what is its ultimate fate before it degrades? We still have a lot to answer around the ecology of eDNA. But then there's a lot we need to work on of methodology of detection. How many samples should you collect? What volume? What methods do you extract them with? What markers do you amplify them with? Where do we find these primer biases and taxonomic blind spots and incomplete reference libraries? There's a fair bit of methodological work that needs to be done. And then of course there's environmental conditions that can impact eDNA. So we've talked about things like PCR inhibitors, but also flow rates, pH, temperature. There's a lot going on that impacts how long that signal hangs around and how detectable it is. Despite all of that, while it's too early to have a, a generalized one-size-fits-all approach to doing this, the overwhelming evidence is this method works, and in many cases, it's more sensitive than conventional methods. It's a great tool, so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there's a bit more research that needs to be done. And to this point about methodology of detection, we did this little Sankey diagram pouring through different eDNA papers, again, looking at targeted detection of freshwater species. And, you know, there are all sorts of different approaches to water preservation, filter preservation, extraction, inhibitor removal, detection. So it's really hard to do a meta-analysis of the current literature because the methods are all over the place. And we want to get at optimization and thinking about do our extraction protocols work for, say, releasing eDNA from particles. And one of the last things that I think is important is we need some sort of an eDNA atlas. Where does all of this data live? You know, we talked about next generation compliance and transparency in data. Well, if I do all of these studies and it just ends up in a report to the ministry or the funder, that's no good. We needed an opportunity for all of this information to be shared collectively. Uh, otherwise, we've just got a lot of expensive chaos. This is a little scenario taken from uh, an, what they're calling an eDNA atlas that USGS uh, has produced in the States. This is kind of cool because what they did, they had tribal groups, 
conservation authorities, uh, you know, Trout Unlimited, folks all over the, the Rocky Mountain West collect water samples. They're looking for bull trout. Bull trout need cold water that's oxygen rich to survive. So they sent, now this is, you know, a government lab, so they've got money. They sent in thousands of samples from all over the Intermountain West. They could build a really nice map of where bull trout still remain. And then there they started to run climate change scenarios and say, okay, under this climate change scenario, some of these current habitats are gonna wink out, but others are gonna persist at a two or a four degree C warming scenario. So in a conservation world of limited dollars, those are the sites we should be putting emphasis on protecting. But the only way that they could do this was to have this massive amount of data in a database that was accessible so that they could start running these models. And that's why I think these tools beyond just the small examples I've shown here, collectively have a lot of power. So with that, I'll just wrap up and say, the future, we're starting to look at things like eRNA, gene expression. Can we look at gene products that might signal, say, heat shock protein? Maybe these fish are stressed. RNA isn't nearly as stable as DNA, but some early work is suggesting that we can recover eRNA from the environment. We've talked about primer biases. We can go to really deep sequencing approaches where we don't even use PCR of a marker gene. We just deep sequence everything that's there. That could be cool, but it's data overload. We don't have the informatics infrastructure to deal with that at present. Um, and then there are other folks that are just saying, let's forget taxonomy and who's in the environment. Let's just probe for things like nitrogen fixing genes in soil. What we really want to know is, is this soil fixing more nitrogen than that soil? Or is that tillage treatment or crop rotation impacting the system? So I think some people will be tempted to just start to look at ecological function writ large beyond the, the members of the taxonomic community. Um, I'm part of two Genome Canada funded projects, the GenFish project, where trying to build targeted assays for all of the freshwater fish of Canada and looking at some of this eRNA. There's a new project led by Louis Bernache and Karen Helbing called iTrack DNA that wants to build on that Canadian Standards Association document and take it to the next level to help mainstream these tools for targeted detection. And we're planning to run another Pisces meeting in May of 2023. We had planned to run it in May of 2020, but COVID sort of put the kibosh on that. So if you're students and you wanna come talk about eDNA or learn more about it, uh, you may wanna save the date. We're still trying to uh, figure out exactly when we can get access to lecture halls in the University of Guelph. But with all of that, I will apologize for running way over and say thank you.